2022. I call to order the Franklin uh, School Committee meeting. Meetings are recorded by Franklin TV and shown on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 29, as well as recorded by Franklin Matters. students in the council chambers right now? We, I see the Gallagher children that <laughs> might be willing to do the pledge. <laughs> you want to do the pledge with us? I'll do it for you if you want. Spot. All right. We'll all do it together. How about that? Yeah. 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 Yes. Hello. Can you hear us? Hello? Dave? We can all hear us. It's okay. Dave, can you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me ask KPA, are you hearing anything right now? I'm good. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. You're here now. There's no student reps this evening, uh, but we will have them starting next meeting. It's the night before school. We thought we'd give them the night off. I think the only time I'm hearing audio in the council chambers is a lot of that feedback loop going on. Um, right now, Vice Chair McNeil, Mike, I take it over to you. If you and I grab the gavel and uh, run the meeting, and then I'll try to um, try to get this resolved and draw back in. Absolutely, we hope uh, to see you soon. <laughs> All right, uh, Superintendent's report. Okay. Good evening, everyone. 
just wanted to kick off with a few updates. First off, uh, the opening day for staff occurred yesterday. Uh, it began yesterday and it, and it transitioned into school. So Monday, October 26th, we welcome the FPS staff to the FHS Franklin High School Auditorium uh, with around a central theme focused on We Are Franklin Public Schools and unifying our district. The day commenced with some opening remarks uh, after being greeted, after staff were greeted by uh, a few parents, some school committee members, administrators, and students uh, as they entered the uh, gymnasium area. And our Panther uh, was on site too. Uh, the program began with some staff recognitions and opening remarks to help us frame our school year. The Office of Teaching and the Learning gave an overview. Sorry. Gave an overview of the year's goals. Can you hear that, KP? KP, can you hear us? Can KP call in? We could, we could just. The problem is, is anyone on Zoom? And then the same issue, it's not just our oh, yeah. teammates. Oh, that's true. Please, because of the renovation. Mm -hmm. they, put the, they put this together again? Yeah. 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 yeah, but it's okay. Uh, the committee will be in research, subject to the call of the chair. On Monday, August 26th, we welcomed the FPS staff to the FHS gymnasium uh, to welcome them for the opening day, uh, surrounded around a theme of three feet in front of you, and we are Franklin Public Schools. The day commenced with staff be members being greeted by some of our parents, students, school committee members, administrators, and our FHS Panther. The program began with staff recognitions and opening remarks to help us frame the school year. 
The Office of Teaching and Learning gave an overview of this year's goals as well. The staff then transitioned to the gymnasium to enjoy coffee, light foot refreshments, and reconnect with colleagues. Following this, staff broke into groups of around 20 to engage in group discussions that centered around two questions. In what ways are you looking forward to growing professionally this year and building connections with students and colleagues? And what support do you need? Uh, those discussions, based on the folks that facilitated, um, reported back that those are really fruitful discussions. And I think there's a lot for us to take away from that as we plan for uh, this school year. And we wrapped up the morning session coming together to watch a video produced by Heather Moreau from our video department. Um, our, our video department and uh, it was it was students who basically put together a video celebrating teachers and thanking them for their hard work uh, we will share that video and public post that publicly uh, but we wanted to make sure our teachers had a chance and our educators and leaders had a chance to see that uh, first and they they we concluded the morning that way uh, many staff members appreciated the pace of the morning and the tone of the messaging uh, to start the day and the atmosphere was overall uh, very positive Today, the school-based teams kicked, kicked off their, um, their work and with their welcoming back staff and led by many of our outstanding principals that you see here today, along with their colleagues, um, to set the, frame the year from a school-based perspective. So I want to give a big shout out to our principals and our assistant principals who uh, pl played a huge role in making that happen today. Our district leadership team had the chance to travel throughout the district to see um, many of the uh, opening day activities and see the staff come together as a school. And I want to just once again uh, send my heartfelt gratitude to all of our leaders for making today really meaningful for teachers and carrying forth what, um, what I felt was a successful day yesterday. And I think it really sets us up for the year uh, we're about to embark on. There's an update from staffing. Our HR director, Ken Storlazzi, prepared a staffing update, which I shared with you earlier. And just for the public, uh, this summer we've hired 44 positions and we still have positions to fill uh, as part that are either in process of hiring or um, that we still need to fill. Um, we continue to hire for open positions. As of August 27th, uh, with those 44 positions, there are six teacher vacancies, nine ESP vacancies, and nine non-union vacancies. So we have several candidates in the pipeline and we've received a total of 48 resignations throughout the summer season. Uh, most of those recognition, uh, resignations we've received over the last two weeks um, and many of them have been instructional interventionist and educational support personnel. And a breakdown of vacancies by position um, have been provided to the, to the committee. Um, transportation, uh, this was a big piece um, we've received Many, many calls and emails just with asking for clarification on transportation as of today. So uh, we sent out a general email to the community, but many individuals have received individual communications regarding their specific transportation circumstances. So with that letter sent to, from the transportation department, um, I've condensed the letter into some bullet points tonight for uh, the community and for the school committee to, to provide more clarity and this information can also be found on the transportation page of the website. It's the first document that you'll see when you go to that link. One, uh, the first thing I'll say is at this time, any student who registered and fully or partially paid before the July 31st deadline has been placed on a bus. At this point, all students, grades K through six, that are over two miles from their school have been assigned to a bus. If you've registered by the deadline and made at least a partial payment, you should receive or will receive a direct email with the name of your child, the bus stop assigned, and the time the bus will pick you up. If you've met this criteria but have not been assigned a bus, please contact Ms. Malati directly for assistance or you can email the school bus link that we've put in the communications that goes to Ms. Malati and her team. Families who registered and paid after July 31st have been waitlisted, and we are assigning bus passes based on available space in the order in which they've registered and paid. If you've been waitlisted, you will also receive an email indicating that you're waitlisted. We continue to work. The staff has been working really hard to accommodate as many people after the July 31st deadline to get as many students on buses at this point. Um, it's a process where we have to re-examine routes and look at um, bus stops and drop-offs 
and try to accommodate for that. And we're doing that and modifying that and trying to accommodate where we can. If you registered before the deadline but no longer require a bus seat, please email schoolbus at franklinps.net so that we can process your refund and assign that seat to another student. Some families, uh, including my own, uh, registered for a bus thinking we would need it. Um, thankfully, um, you know, we were in a situation where we no longer required transportation and I was able to let the transportation department know that those two seats can be filled by someone who may need them. Buses will be available. Bus passes will be available to children who have been assigned to a bus on September 4th. The bus drivers have been instructed to wait until September 16th before checking bus passes. As a result, buses are likely to be crowded for the first few weeks while we finalize routes and those who registered and paid prior to the extended deadline. After September 16th, only students who have a bus pass will be able to ride a bus. This is a common practice that we have where we start the year off while we're sorting it out as adults, we allow kids to enter a bus to kick the first few weeks while we confirm the lists and the routes. The students living in the emergency shelter have a dedicated bus beyond our usual bus numbers that we have, and this money was paid through the earmark stake funds that we already received and does not impact our current situation as it exists. And I refer people back to the transportation page for the revised bus routes so they can find the stop that's closest to their home. And finally, this situation uh, is not a result of a failed override or uh, any other financial issue. It, it's due to a higher number of registrants in certain schools on specific routes, as well as registrations and payments that were received after the deadline. And I wanted to thank everyone for their patience and understanding. We'll continue to work through our process. Ms. Malati is uh, personally overseeing this process at this point to, to make sure that we resolve as many issues as possible. And uh, we'll continue to update folks. They'll continue to see emails come through. Um, once they've been approved. That concludes my superintendent's report for the evening. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, go down the line. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, kind of going back to staffing, is that is the number of vacancies that we have at the moment, you know, kind of something that we typically see? Is it more, a higher number than you'd usually see? And are we, where are we in terms of being able to fill those for, for students and families? I, I would say this number, typically we try to come into the year. We've had, we've had situations where we've hired staff. I think I heard a principal comment this morning that it's the first year he's, he's hired his uh, staff and then not been ghosted on day one where someone just doesn't show up, that's happened. And, um, but I would say that number, this is, this is a little bit higher than I think we, we typically see. Okay. Um, to have the, the number of vacancies, I think uh, we're seeing it, particularly when I think of the number of ESPs that are unfilled as we enter the year. Um, and I would say it's a higher number than we typically have seen. And do you feel like that you have applicants coming in for those yeah. positions, or is it harder to get applicants in the door for, for those positions? I mean, I'll just speak, I'll speak for our team. I think it gets increasingly difficult as the season goes on. Mm -hmm. I think prime season, when people are actually the highest number of pools, is when we're looking at right after the April vacation. People yeah. come back, they start to look. If you think about it from a, from a perspective of someone changing a job and a location, it makes sense at that point so you can get your ducks in a row and line up and conclude your year, give enough notice. Um, unfortunately, I think our cycle of how we've um, operated and kind of the, bu the budget timeline, I think the time in which we lay off, we kind of work backwards to the, to the, um, the meeting where we get our funding approved. But I do think um, when I look at this, I think we get to the summer and it gets, it gets increasingly challenging, That's if funny. I'm being honest. Um, and then moving into transportation, do you have a sense of how many students are still looking for transportation that haven't been resolved yet? We currently have 31 students that are waitlisted. Uh, we will be able to assign a few of them uh, throughout this week. 
as we were able to, I met with bus, uh, with the bus transportation, with Brian, and we were able to add an extra bus uh, to Horace Mann. So we are able to accommodate more students. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a time-consuming process. Uh, they were replying to all the emails I can, uh, but I believe that by Friday, uh, I can have a better number for you guys. Okay, thank you so much for all of, I know that the last, Day especially has been a lot getting through all of all of the emails out to folks and and you know kind of moving people around to make sure that we can get as many kids on the bus as possible so thank you so much thank you Paul. Uh, so yeah first I wanted to reiterate you know just how much I appreciate the efforts that you've put in Jana over the past 24 hours uh, I can just imagine um, the sheer number of emails uh, but I know that you've been you've been very responsive um, where you can um, and I appreciate that you've been responding with uh, action instead of just you know kind of a, a continued hold button um, so thank you very much for that um, and then your staff I know it's a lot um, but we do appreciate that um, one question I had was regarding the number of buses that we have this year is it roughly the same as past years the same number of buses it is the same number of buses with the addition of uh, the hotel bus that we added and the new horseman bus that we just added to that. So we have two routes. Okay. Thank you. Al? Yep. All right. Um, so one, thank you for just a good start in terms of the uh, opening day. Mm -hmm. um, it was great to see the, the teachers come in and thank staff come in. Um, I have to say my, my children were, were not necessarily like this is the, the first thing they wanted to do, but I think after the teachers started coming, <laughs> flowing in, and they started seeing like the teachers that they've had in younger grades, and it's, it was just kind of like, oh, this is great, and they had a, they had a blast. You couldn't tell they didn't want to be there, the way yeah. they were dancing. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they definitely warmed up really, really fast. Um, but that was really great to see all the educators, and, and thank you all for just coming in and, you know, starting the year off right, um, and then really strong. Um, the... The question I had, I had a few questions. Um, I know that there was a lot of resignations, and you said mm -hmm. primarily uh, from the ESPs. Um, do we know, like, what was the re reasoning behind that uh, first, I guess? So I can answer the, the process we go through. I send a letter to anyone who resigns that says that I accept their resignation and wish them the best, and then we have two options for them. They can book a meeting to, to sit with me um, to talk through the reasons they've resigned, or they can fill out a form. Um, I don't receive a lot back once people have made that decision. I do have a handful of folks who've submitted the form, and uh, what I will be doing is, is looking through that data. Some of these were more recent um, to really look at, see, see if there's a theme um, so that we can, can look from that. That was a recommendation three years ago that we put in place just to make sure that we had some way of kind of tracking and getting a sense of why people would leave. So um, it's really tough to tell um, with ESPs and our instructional interventionists just given the nature of some of the positions and where um, folks can work um, so uh, what I will do is I will share out whatever I hear as far as I, if there's any common themes okay thank, thank you um, and the, I guess for the public that may not be familiar with what ESPs do um, I guess what is the impact to our students education because of the, the lack of ESPs I'd be happy to answer um, our ESPs so we have ESPs who help support IEP services, so they support our students within the general ed classroom, doing some reteaching and pre-teaching. I'm pre, yeah, so I'm right. Re thank you, <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Kokori. Reteaching and pre-teaching, um, provide making sure students are getting their accommodations that are outlined in their IEP. Um, they also help with students who need breaks throughout the day um, due to sensory ish challenges, um, and they also help support and monitor students in the in the um, unstructured times such as recess and lunch and hallways and bathrooms and whatnot. So they're very important. Um, many of them are tied to legal minutes in the students' IEPs. Um, so what we do is we get creative and our principals and assistant principals are very great, good at that, um, making sure that services are still being delivered, but it's all hands on deck and everyone helping out. Gotcha, great. So, so these are, in essence, the, the glue folks. Like, I mean, we, we all know our teachers that send the emails to say, hey, welcome to the classroom, but these are the people that help support all those gaps and really make it so the, the teachers can do their jobs effectively and efficiently. 
Absolutely. Great. So, um, yeah, so definitely unsung heroes. Um, Correct. So for those that volunteer for PCCs, make sure when you are donating and whatnot, make sure you're thinking about the, you know, these are the teachers that help your students as well. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, and then looking at the positions, um, yeah, this reminds me of what, like two years ago. I feel like the last year we were in a good space with hiring. The first the year before, we were struggling and trying to catch up throughout the year. Um, I see we have the assistant director of HR. I'm assuming this is needed because of to help do all yes. of the hiring. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. And then the junior district administrator. Can you just elaborate on that one a little bit? I'm not too sure what that was. The Duke Junior Network Administrator? Junior District Administrator. It's it's under the district wide section. It wasn't there for the August thirteenth vacancy, so I wasn't too sure what that was. We can check right now. Or is that a typo? It might be. Let me just see. It's, that's a, that should say junior network administrator. Okay. That's okay. a current position we have in the technology department that's existed. Um, there's a network administrator and a junior network administrator. Gotcha. It's a two-person um, team that runs all the networking for the schools in the town. Okay. So that's that's a typo. Okay. That's a good catch. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, so I was thinking one. junior district. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Is that like an assistant? Thank you. Um, and then the last question I have is around transportation, or at least a slew of questions. So just so I understand correctly, <laughs> Um, for the transportation process, um, at the end of the school year, we put out, if you need bus, uh, please sign up by X date, pay by X date, um, and it was at a certain price, at like 360. We had the fail override, some people had done it and they paid the 360, um, but then come deadline, but then it raised, so people had to pay the, the difference. So come deadline, um, there were people that hadn't paid fully, and those folks are all set. Yes. And then the folks that are now impacted are folks that either signed up and did not pay at all, or did not sign up for a bus initiative. The that? folks that are waitlisted currently, uh, who have a register after August 1st, uh, either making a payment or not, they are on the waitlist. Okay. Everyone else that we assigned the bus, they either paid in full by the 31st or they're still paying. They're on a payment plan. Gotcha. Okay. So, so I feel like for the, for the most part, the folks that did what they did met the deadline, they're, they're not negatively impacted or penalized. No. It's, 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 it, I mean, this is kind of like just BAU. If it was any other year, you came in late. You're yep. on the wait list. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah. Because I think I think from uh, like an outside in, like the way it kind of snowballed. I mean, I, this is what I thought it was, but folks are just making it bigger than it really is, and I, I thank you for the clarity. Um, I do appreciate that there is accommodation being done. Um, I guess when that's done, though, that impacts the full bus route. So, for example, if my bus stop was now was at six fifty, we'll say, and it was changed, my time could change, and, and as as a result, I would get communication for that, right? Yes. Okay. And we've done that. Each year, we've made adjustments after that two-week buffer period to just get a sense of the bus routes. The bus drivers provide feedback, and they do make uh, slight changes to routes. It does; it has occurred in the past, so that's not a new. That's not a result of this particular issue. And I appreciate you walking through the timeline because there are folks that fall into a category where they didn't meet the timeline, um, and we're trying to just like we normally would. It just definitely, um, you know, the other piece of it is I think you know the one piece I would say is when people registered for a bus at, by the deadline. Um, after the deadline, there was no um, indication that it was failed. So I think that caused a delay in people knowing, and I think that's where the communication piece. So we have um, debriefed the, the process and the system and where we're gonna be working next year to figure out how can we, um, obviously we try to learn from all situations. It doesn't change the fact that there was a deadline that needed to be met, but on the flip side, I think it just would provide a layer of an added layer of communication that I think would help of would have helped uh, this not become as uh, prominent as it was to start the year off. Yeah, 
and said, yep, and thank you for acknowledging that and, and looking for a, a path forward to mm -hmm. improve it next time. Thank you. So. You're all with that? Um, thanks for the great kickoff. I think that um, I, I saw some emails and, and it seems like the staff was very pleased with your kickoff. Somebody wrote that it's the best they've ever had in 18 years, which is something to be said considering how last year ended, kind of tough. So um, thanks for keeping everyone's morale up. Yeah. It's um, a team effort, I think, everyone in this room. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. thanks to all of you. Um, hiring 44 people this summer is remarkable for one HR person, essentially, um, kind of doing that work. Um, just typically in the private sector, there's like one HR person per 50 employees or per, per, per maybe 100 employees or 200 employees. So we have like, what, 1,100 employees. So um, that's remarkable work. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't address something that was um, published today. We have a kind of a blogger in town who uh, kind of came on the offense a little bit at you guys. So just, um, I talked to many parents who uh, resented the article that was put out um, in Franklin, uh, not by Steve Sherlock, um, never by Steve Sherlock. But um, it was it was a it was just a bit a bit of a gut punch and didn't offer the schools any grace, um, and so with the transportation issue, so I would um, I know Lucas, you mentioned none of this occurred because of the override, um, and I think literally yes, there is it's not like we're short of bus because we can't afford the bus, um, but I would I would cross examine that a little bit that you know if we had maybe uh, another admin. Uh, in the office working with Jana or, or any of you that maybe um, it, it would create a less of a bandwidth problem for your staff. I know that this summer's been very challenging. Um, and, and there was emails that went out in May, in June, and extended to July. So, you know, there was, there was that for people to be able to sign up for the buses. So um, you're handling it, you're great. Um, and obviously as a district, we're not we're not proactively like, you know, when, when you plan a wedding, sometimes you pay for an extra table in case, you know, Aunt, Aunt Jane and Uncle Joe don't RSVP and they show up, but we don't, we don't have that kind of luxury here in the district to, to be able to kind of, you know, just in case, assuming we more kids sign up, let's just contract an extra bus because that would cut into like teachers and things like that. So um, everyone kind of already answered my questions, but um, just appreciate all the hard work. You, one thing that was um, sort of said in that article this morning was, you know, this, this is a problem you would think that, like, oh, by the end of the summer, this would all be figured out. And um, if people saw you guys in here moving boxes, filling filing cabinets while the carpets are being torn up, moving computers, hiring 44 people, fixing schedules, like, it's, it's a lot. So um, I get that a lot of these requests that are coming in are sort of having to be triaged. So thank you. I don't know if there's a question there, but it's just thank you. <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you, Ruthann. And to our members online, uh, KP, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the great Detective Lucas. Uh, I hope the signs we are FPS signs everywhere uh, in those pictures. Um, we're making a lot of positive vibe across our school district. Um, we saw so many WhatsApp photos as well. Thank you for that. And the uh, second thing is in transportation, um, you know, we got very positive feedback of the guys handling the uh, issues with the students. However, um, we hear that they're still hiring the drivers for buses, so is there any problem with the drivers? Is there, is there anything, any other of that? Because uh, the coming week is very important for our students. They're still in the process of hiring drivers. I know that across the state, uh, many of the bus companies are struggling to secure drivers. We have the drivers we need um, through Holmes Bus. Uh, however, uh, with Jana requesting an in-person meeting with the owner of the company today to really um, put, a, put a real thoughtful, sincere request in for our need and try to advocate for our district, when they service many other districts, she was able to get that bus. So I, I would credit Ms. Malati, who's developed a, a, in a very short time um, a good working relationship with our bus company, and at this point, I do not believe that the drive we have a driver issue on our hands at this time. That can always change, just like 
my example of the principal who got ghosted on day one in previous years, you could always have that happen. But at this point, I don't believe we have a driver shortage specifically in Franklin Public Schools at this time with the company. I guess my final request is going to be about, uh, you know, for the coming week, uh, you know, for the parents and the transportation is first priority. We have to do have transportation of any special request in the last minute. If we can, you know, please try to accommodate them. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, KP. And uh, Chair Callahan. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it, Chair McNeil, thanks for, for kind of taking over right now, too. Um, so, uh, Luke, it's uh, just kind of two things on transportation. So I know you kind of mentioned it um, during the Superintendent's report, but just to confirm, so because you know, bus uh, kids are going to get picked up in less than 12 hours right now. So uh, right now, if there's a kiddo outside their house tomorrow morning, will uh, regardless of, of when uh, folks registered, when they paid, whatever the situation is. Uh, will the bus be stopping to pick them up and bring them to school? Yes. They've been instructed to and do so. Per every other bus driver has been instructed to do so and pick the kids up, regardless of the bus pass, the, the, the timing, mm -hmm. no matter what, every kid who's outside tomorrow morning will be delivered and, and transported to their school. Yes, for this probationary period, uh, with the caveat that that's also going to create some crowding on buses that we anticipate and we experience every year, and then we'll need to settle down and suss through who's who's on a bus and who's not. To clarify, without speaking out of turn, they still need to be at a bus stop, bus right? Stop. Yes. They have to be at a bus, bus stop. stop. Yes, thank you for sure the clarification. <laughs> People aren't standing at their front door waiting. No, they have correct. to go to the closest bus stop. Correct. Uh, and for that, I uh, appreciate that. Um, with that, uh, the in terms of the closest bus stops, that's something that everybody can kind of find right online. I know it was uh, mm -hmm. listed in that email that talks yeah. about all of the bus stops uh, for each of the schools, correct? Along with like an approximate timeline about when that bus will be arriving. Correct. On the, tra on the main page, it's a transportation icon on the top right, but you can also just search for the transportation page directly. Okay, terrific. Just so at least to kind of assuage some, some concerns and some fears right now. So for any of the parents that are out there, families, guardians listening, uh, you know, your kiddo will be brought to school if they're at a proper bus stop on time uh, tomorrow morning and for that, that probation period through September 16th? Yes. Correct. Is that correct? Okay, great. And then um, additionally, I appreciate you uh, mentioning that you are already kind of working uh, with your team to kind of figure out different solutions to ensure that this does not happen in the future. Um, perhaps, I know we can kind of chat about it uh, later as well, but I would love to, to um, see if we can pick a date, preferably by the end of the uh, calendar year, where we can kind of um, circle back to that and have that presented at like a school committee meeting. So that way everybody kind of knows uh, the changes that, that will be implemented just to ensure that this does not happen uh, again for any subsequent school years. So I will say two things. One, yes, we can, we can follow up on that. The one thing we cannot do, and I want to be very clear with everyone in this community, if we put out a deadline to register, we need that information so the bus company knows how many buses we need. And we will account for who we can predict that we will need to transport, but we cannot. So even with the best system in place, if you don't register your children, it's really hard for us to plan and we can't tell the bus company in August what we need. We lucked out more recently for one bus, but we need to have that information as your backwards plan, just like you would anything um, that requires that level of organization to make happen. So I just wanna be clear, we will put deadlines out, we will communicate them, but none of this is gonna change. The people that are waiting right now did not meet a deadline. And I'm not saying that to you know, incite emails. I'm not, I'm not saying it for that reason. What I'm telling you though, I'm just trying to be honest with everyone. If you don't register by the time of a deadline, it's hard for us to be able to commit and guarantee. That said, I think our, on our end, I think the communication on when you register to get confirmations, if it's closed that you receive a, a direct uh, message that it's closed, gives you the information you need to know what your next steps may be. And I think that's what we will commit to is certainly is to have a, a system in place that allows people to understand in real time where they're at. And uh, I just want to put that out there as, 
you know, we deal with this annually, and I've dealt with it in previous districts as well, but I just want to be clear about deadlines and why we have them so that we can plan effectively. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, otherwise, I'm good. Thank you. Oh. I do one thing. Sure. Oh. Sorry. Um, and I just remembered this. Um, so I know in this may be just for the school committee in general. Um, before our ter first terms, I know that there was like a... Uh, a liaison on the school committee for like the school buses. I don't know if that's something that we want to revisit. It was? Yeah. I thought so. I thought Tim Keenan was on it, like the bus routes or something. I could be wrong, but I, I thought there may have well been. Before us. Yeah, like, yeah, well before us. So I don't know. You can look it, into that. Yeah, maybe if it's something just like from a liaison perspective. Can you, can you change your history? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and other than that, I just want to thank you and your entire team uh, for all the preparation work you've been doing over the summer for the start of the year. And yeah, wishing everyone and your entire team the, a great start to the year. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then moving right along, um, discussion action items. I understand that we have some presentations regarding the, the handbook. So could we just do all the presentations for all the different levels all at once? Would that make the most sense? I'm fine with that. So Excellent. I wanted to just thank the uh, Mrs. Morano, uh, who oversees the Department for Student Services and also has worked with our principals and assistant principals to update our handbooks at a time where it was a very busy summer, um, but this was certainly one of the priorities they've worked on. Uh, they've put together a presentation, and I'll kick it over to Paula to share a little bit more um, so that you have the information you need. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gigi. Still my words. But yes, this summer, amongst the trying to take some vacation time and do some hiring, our principals and assistant principals got together to review and revise our handbooks at all levels. I'll call up um, Dr. Weber and Mr. Walsh, um, Ms. B. Savage and Ms. Harvey, as well as Mr. Williams to present some of the changes. Um, so as they make their way up to the um, desk, I will explain that we have three sections to our handbooks. Section one are the school specific handbook, um, school specific information and procedures for every school. Um, this year there were no substantial changes to that section one other than maybe changing some names or changing some dates or whatnot. Section two of our handbook is the level based policy and procedures which will be presented tonight. Um, the, a few of the minor changes as well as the major changes that were made. And then our section three is our school committee policy section of the handbook. So those are the policies that you all reviewed throughout the previous school year and read twice and then um, adopted. And the only change for that one is the meal charge policy and procedure, which you did adopt on June 18th. So I would like our, one of our panelists introduce themselves because um, we have some new administrators up there at the, at the desk and then they can begin. Hi, good evening. I'm Carrie B. Savage, principal at Helen Keller Elementary School. Hi, I'm Amy Harvey. I'm the assistant principal at Parmenter and Kennedy this year. Craig Williams, principal of Remington Middle School. Hi, Maria Weber, principal of Franklin High School. And Mike Walsh, assistant, assistant principal at the high school. I'm not sure who in charge of that. Oh, we can go to the next slide. School. Okay, I, I guess I'm up. So, <laughs> um, so we only had one substantive change in our handbook that you may be familiar with. It is the change to our cell phone policy. We did have a cell phone policy in place, however, um, we just made some clear expectations in terms of when and where it is permitted during different times of the day in school. So cell phones, use, cell phones are not permitted during class time. Um, the expectation is that they are placed in a cell phone holder that is located in each classroom. Um, cell phones must remain in the classroom when a student leaves. So if they need to go to the bathroom or a house office or visit guidance um, and are expected to return to class, they should leave their cell phone in the classroom. Um, times during the day when cell phones are permitted are during passing time, lunch time, and during direct study periods. Uh, some minor changes that we had to our handbook involve graduation credits. There's a section that talks about um, the number of credits that is required for 
each grade level, and you'll notice that it varies. And the reason why it varies is because of the recent changes to our programs of studies over the last few years. The most recent one is the um, implementation of personal finance as a course that's re recommended, I mean, it's required. And then prior to that, last year we added um, an art requirement, and then prior to that it was uh, a world language additional requirement. So that's why there's a change in the number of credits that is listed for each grade level. Uh, there's a small change to our dress code policy. It's mainly related to physical education classes. The expectation is that students have appropriate footwear um, so they can be the most productive and also be safe during their activities. And another change we made was to our search policy. So this section is really, the search policy is really relevant to our um, code of conduct and procedural part of um, how we interact with students when there is a suspicion of something inappropriate. It's maybe a, a vape device or um, anything that requires, a, you know, that raises suspicion of an un, something that could potentially be unsafe. So we wanted to clarify the language um, for students and families that if an administrator identifies the need um, and asks the student to search their belongings, and that, that's a process of we, where we just kind of go through a backpack of the student. Um, we hope that, typically, you know, it comes with cooperation, um, but sometimes students um, choose to refuse, and that, that's typically not a choice that we would support. So we needed to add a little bit of language that said very clearly that if you choose to refuse to allow a search, or you choose to run after we've asked you know, a student to escort us to the office where we could ask some questions and find out some more information, then that is an admission of guilt. So for whatever the suspected infraction might be, um, we, would, we would move forward with the, the due process of um, assuming that that student did in fact partake in the activity or, or, or had the suspicious item that we suspected. So for the middle schools, um, the middle schools did not have uh, substantial changes for the for school year 24-25. Um, over the past few years, there have been a lot of changes um, in our handbook, uh, making sure that all three middle schools are on the same page, um, aligned both vertically with elementary and then uh, progressing developmentally to the high school. Um, so really our focus is more so as the three middle schools will next year, or in 25, 26, be turning into one, uh, making sure that we're really as consistent as possible in the enforcement of the handbook. So that will be a major focus of the administration as opposed to tweaking the handbook. Um, that said, uh, we do have some minor changes. Um, we uh, wanted to articulate um, with our cell phone policy of expecting the cell phones to remain in students' lockers. Uh, again, the developmental difference between middle school and high school um, that we want to put in that same type of um, restriction for headphones and earbuds, um, making sure that, you know, living in the distracted world uh, that we live in, uh, that when a teacher is providing instruction or the students expected to be um, working uh, with a group in class, they're not uh, listening to, to music. As we know, that's, that's not going to help them focus. Um, so making sure that we articulate that um, unless they have, um, they're instructed to do so by a teacher for, for academic purposes. Um, if they do help, if it is independent work and the student will benefit from being able to listen to music in that moment and a teacher provides that discretion, then the student can have their headphones. Um, the other uh, tweak we had, we had a, a tiered response to absences uh, articulated in the handbook. Um, with the increased uh, amount of, the, like all schools in the Commonwealth, uh, an increased um, amount of tardies, we wanted to make sure that we were tiering our responses for tardies as well. Um, and tardies uh, can be caused by a multitude of reasons. And so knowing that, having um, a, a system in place in which we start off making sure that we are addressing uh, what, the, what the issue is, what's causing that student to be late, um, and then uh, providing more responses in terms of if it requires some mental health support, 
um, community resources, uh, and making sure that we can help the student um, be able to, to come to school on time, ready to learn, uh, because we know that when a student's routinely tardy, um, it can, it, it, it um, adds to the bandwidth of trying to sustain, trying to learn. Um, and so these are habits that we want to help them um, try to pr promote being on time and ready. So those are the tweaks we made at the middle level. Great, and at the elementary level, we have some minor um, changes, um, specifically in language, but um, first we have our dress code, which does align closely with the middle school. Hats and head coverings are allowed. Um, during the school day. However, they can't be a distraction to the learning environment. So we will ask students to remove the hat if that's a problem. Uh, we are asking that hoodies are not allowed to be worn on their heads. For that reason, um, more of a connection reason, when they have their big hoodies over their heads, we can't see their eyes. And we can't try to connect with the student. We can't see if they're engaged. We can't see how they're feeling. So we are asking that hoodies to be lowered or, or put down. Um, the other change is to footwear, similar to the high school. We are asking that all footwear for PE, that footwear for PE is required for sneakers. That again is another safety issue, um, not just you know muscle and bone and issues, but also being outside on that playground and on the fields, they can have contact with rocks and sticks. So that becomes a safety issue as well. For arrival and dismissal, we are asking, um, we had these beautiful signs just made up at the five elementary schools that are, congratulations, hooray, you're on time. <laughs> um, we're gonna have a great day. And then at 8.30, when the, that is our bell to come in and be on time and be in your classroom, it does say, oops, you're late. Um, please park your car and bring your child into the building to sign your child in. So we are asking that parents sign their child in if they are late uh, arriving to school. Um, that again is a safety issue where sometimes parents will drop their student off at the door thinking that it'll just be a quick second for them to get buzzed in and if there's no one at the front desk at the office, sometimes they're out there at two, not an expected time frame. Um, and finally, absenteeism. We're are looking to add um, the language of chronic absenteeism is anything um, greater than 10% of a term. And so what we want to add is of a term. So a term is 60 days, 10% of that is six days. If a student is absent for six days, a letter will go home at the end of the term, just notifying the parents of the, and caregivers of the amount of days that they are out and coming up with um, a way that we can just meet and support the student and the family to get the child um, in on time and in, in during the day. Um, and then um, we did delineate out what exactly is an excused absence versus an unexcused absence. So some excused absences are anything that's documented by a well visit, a doctor's note, dentist's note, um, a, a documented injury or illness, a bereavement, um, major religious observation, and then anything um, ex extraordinary family circumstances is at the discretion of the principal. Anything else would be an unexcused absence. So we just wanted to really get that in there specifically. And then finally for family vacations, we, um, if a student is out for 10 or more days, they are unenrolled in the Franklin Public Schools, and they are um, asked to re-enroll before they come back to school. So that, we just want to be specific in that language for family vacations. Um, thank you. Um, and as uh, Mrs. Harvey was saying too, some of the tweaks um, in our language to the handbook are just reiterating sometimes one word can place a little bit more emphasis on a policy that was in existence. Uh, but we just wanted to draw more attention to that um, and be really clear um, and specific. For cell phones, um, the elementary handbook policy does progress to like middle school in terms of what's appropriate. So cell phones must be offed, off, and if they're off, they're silent, um, but remaining in a student's backpack. 
Um, so not in a desk, um, not in their pockets of their sweatshirt, but keeping them um, in their backpack. If a student needs to place a call, teachers can help support that, the front office can help support that if they need to be in contact with a parent during the school day, okay? Um, same applies to smartwatches um, in terms of being off and silenced um, and in backpacks um, during the school day as well. Um, we have the same language if, um, and they can be used, I'm sorry, once students leave the, the building, um, a lot of times parents like to communicate with students once they leave, they can turn their phones on um, as they enter, if they're walking or if they're on the bus. Um, if there's reason to believe that the phone is being used or misused, I guess, by a student during the day, then it is with administration, kind of, that phone is held um, and that it is stored in the office um, and it can be subject to search um, as well at that time if there's reason to believe it was misused. So that's just some language around cell phones. Um, forgotten items. This we wanted to note, it falls in line with um, the visitor management email that, um, and letter that Dr. Rogers shared today, but just sort of <coughs> noting that if there are, because this would be a shift at elementary, if um, a family is coming on um, campus to deliver a library book, a water bottle, something that they're leaving, all of our vestibule areas will be equipped with tables and post-it notes to label where we're dropping off items. Um, in terms of entering the office for something like that. Dismissals regarding health, um, doctor's appointments that require entry to be signed out, um, families will be coming in to do that. So we just wanted to note that um, in the handbook. The last was um, we did not previously have a statement around retention, um, and we just wanted to acknowledge that there is a process um, for parents to request a meeting regarding retention um, between January 30th and March 30th. Um, so the process has been in place in our schools, but we just wanted to make sure that was included um, as part of the language of our handbook. All right. Thank well, thank you all very much. Um, I will do questions before we um, do the vote. So I'll go on that line. Uh, no specific questions, I don't think. I just um, thank you for all these thoughtful, clearly thoughtful adjustments to the language um, within the manuals. Paul? Well, I had uh, two questions and one comment. Um, so for the high school search policy, um, I just wanted to, to kind of double check. You know, from my understanding, this is something really a matter of keeping people safe. So you don't have anyone chasing someone down, someone tripping, someone getting hurt. So that's really kind of the center focus on that, correct? It's just keeping people safe instead of chasing after somebody. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yes, it's, it's also, you know, part of the process Clearly we want to keep the student involved safe, but also we need to make sure that the student doesn't have anything that potentially could be exposed to other students making them unsafe. And that's really the purpose behind a search. Okay. And then with that search, um, just for clarity, based on the language there, does the admin need to declare what they suspect at some point in time during that process? Or is it just they ask for a search? I just want to make sure that we're pretty clear on that. Sure. So um, if we would only be doing a search if we had reasonable suspicion mm -hmm. that there was something unsafe. Um, so it might be, for instance, in the bathroom, in the, an odor of marijuana. Mm -hmm. And so that would result in a search. So um, we would, you know, the students would be brought into the office and uh, searched, but again, only, only on the basis of some sort of reasonable suspicion. Could be a teacher reported um, hearing something, smelling something, seeing something. Yeah, the reason I ask is I think there, there are different classifications of what could or could not be suspected, and that admission of guilt can really go pretty far um, with what could you know basically come out of that um, based on certain safety concerns versus just you know, substance concerns or other, other contraband, things like that. So that's just one thought uh, kind of going forward that we're specific as to what we, you know, basically what those consequences could be by declaring what we suspect in the first place. Mm -hmm. If a student's going to be searched, Telling them what we suspect. If they're going to stand there and, and be and you know accept it, that's one thing. But if they're going to take off, at least having some kind of clarification as to what is that outcome might be helpful. It, it's I'll, I'll say that it's always explained in the process. Okay. Yeah. Great. We, that's yeah, it. Yeah, that's talking. that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And sometimes even when when we notice the students resistant, that's when we'll contact the parent and say, you know, your students here in the office. This is 
what we suspect, and, and typically the parents will, you know, are on board and say, please go, you know, go forward. So it, it is thoroughly explained, I will say. Fantastic. Um, it, you know. Okay, well, thank you. Sorry. Um, and then my other question is actually for the middle school side of things. Uh, so this tardiness tiering, is that along the same basically schedule as the absence tiering, or is it more delayed, is it sooner, kind of how does that? Yeah, I'd say it's, it's very similar. Uh, following the idea of uh, like 10% of uh, students, 10% of the school days is considered you know, chronic um, if you exceed that number. So we're following along that similar path. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Al? Yep. Uh, so, a few questions. Um, so, the high school cell phone policy. Um, so, can you elaborate, like, what the process is with that, that holder, the storage system? Like, what happened? How does that work? Yeah. So, actually, uh, prior to COVID, we had a system of um, using these classroom sort of containers. They're, they're like pocket holders. They, there's, they're numbered. There's about 30 to a holder, and they hang up in the classroom and the student just would walk in and place their phone in it. Um, we really started that process and it really caught on and then unfortunately COVID put a pause to it and then it wasn't reinstated, reinstated in the same way. Um, so we were fortunate to have a lot of those whole, whole cell phone holders already. So we only needed to purchase just a few more, which was great. Um, so the, the, it, they are available in every single classroom we are trying to be consistent about, well, we are consistent about the placement of those, so it's really easy for the student to just come in, know exactly where to look, know exactly where to put it, um, so that the expectation is just consistent across every classroom as much as possible. Gotcha, okay. So in, in pretty much, they go to their first period class, the expectation is that they take their cell phone, they put it in, in a X numbered pouch, they go do their, their their class duties, whatever the class may be, at the end of the class, then they, they take it before they go to the next class. Is that kind of the, the process? Exactly. Okay. Um, and so it was, was it enforced, like was it used, I know you said it was started before COVID, but was this done like infrequently last year? Like I guess what, what like I guess I'm trying to wonder how much of an ch impact is it to our students this year? So yeah, I mean the reason obviously with COVID was just the idea of touching yeah. you know, anything. So um, so <laughs> when we came back, I think it was, um, that we were slow to come back to the idea of, of, um, of asking teachers to collect cell phones. Um, so it is, there's, there's definitely, um, it's definitely a little bit of a culture shift in the school for the students to, um, you know, to get used to the idea of turning over their cell phones. But, you know, really, re the reality is last year we did, you know, have a policy that was, you know, cell phones had to be off and away, but um, you know, we just think that this is going to be a little bit tighter, yep. a little bit easier for everyone to to uh, just know that we're putting the phones away for you know to get get away from distractions. Yep, that, that makes sense. Yeah, and I think consistency will be key. I think that, that, at that point, it's just second nature. But between now and then, there's going to be that little rub where folks are going to forget, or it's going to you're going to lose some time because you're you went to your desk and sat up, sat down, and then it's like, oh, do you put your phone away? And it's like, to do that. So it, it, that's one thing I just want folks to be cognizant of and, and be mindful of. Um, okay, so that's that one. Um, so tardiness, so just to pick up, back up on that one. Um, so I'm glad that there's, we're, we're being a little bit more forceful with the policy and, and holding folks accountable. Um, Ms. Harvey, you mentioned the, the, like the signs. So can you elaborate on that a little bit more? So we had five, um, for the five elementary schools, it's almost like a, a tea stand or a tent. And on one side at 8.15 or 8.10, we'll put it out and it says, hooray, you're on time, we're gonna, going to have a great day. Then at 8.30 when the bell does ring, signifying that class is starting and anyone after the bell is late, we'll flip it to the other side and it says, oops, you're late. Please bring your child, in, escort your child into the building to sign your child. So it just uh, it helps the parents know I can't just drop the students off. Gotcha. Okay. No, perfect. Thank you. Thanks for clarify that it was all elementary schools. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah. yeah, I think that helps yeah. because I've seen in, in times, you know, people come, like as I'm leaving and it's it's come at the cusp, people are coming in and then they're just like, all right, come over here, we get in. Yeah, so, so it, makes, it makes sense. 
Um, but speaking of drop off as well, and it's not necessarily a, a change. Um, one thing that I, I've heard a lot last year was parents dropping off before eight fifteen. Are we? Is, has there been thought of like anything about the language there so that we don't have somebody saying, "Well, you know, I have to go to work at, you know, I got to be at work at eight fifteen. I'm going to drop you off at eight o'clock. You know, you just wait outside. You know, like how do we?" prevent that from happening because I kids. think in the past too at the building level we've communicated with our families that it is an unsupervised drop-off um, and I think we do have families that will drop off at 805 um, a little bit sometimes um, to get ahead of the line um, that's forming um, for drop-off but that it is not an actively supervised drop-off time so I do agree and I think that could be something that we could consider adding um, knowing that 8.15 is the start time um, when there are teachers um, that are outside greeting students um, as they arrive there. So that is, I think, something that um, we have seen. I don't know if it's yeah. consistent across all of our schools, but yeah. um, I do think we do see that. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then the, the hood policy. Can we talk about that? So I guess elaborate with what the, the process around that one is, I guess. So it, we've been seeing a trend where students will have, wear their zip up hoodies and have their hoods over their heads pretty much throughout a lesson or throughout the day and asking them to remove the heads, the hoodies they don't want to or they say no. And it's just a way that if you, if I have my hoodie up, I, I can't, or you can't see me, you can't make a connection with me, you can't see if I'm upset, if I'm engaged in the lesson. So we are just asking that students put your hoodie down. When you go outside, you can put it up, but during a lesson in, in the classroom, it needs to stay down. Gotcha, okay. So it would be akin to wearing a, a hat with a brim if it's in front of your face, if you can't see that, so should that be? Sometimes with a hat, with a baseball hat, I can still see because it doesn't engulf my whole face. Mm -hmm. With wear these oversized sweatshirts, their whole, face is, is covered. Gotcha, okay. I think also too, um, at the upper grades, um, for earbuds in use too, mm -hmm. with hoods up as well. So I think that's another um, reason. Okay. Thank you. And then the last thing I had, um, cell phones in elementary school. I, I, I feel old saying this, but that, that's like <laughs> very shocking. Um, I mean, like I got my personal cell phone in high school. My kids don't get it until middle school. Elementary school doesn't make sense, but everybody has their own policies. Um, I think, like, a suggestion for the district, I mean, I, I'm an Apple guy, and you can l lock down your phones and what kids can have access to. I don't know if maybe the district can provide some education. Speaking my language, like, I like, like this. What are, what are the going. things that you can do to lock it down? So at least mm -hmm. from, a, from a school perspective, yeah, they can have it. They can use the phone to call if for some reason they need to use that in the emergency, God forbid, but all the other stuff that they can't get access to. Um, so I don't know if, if we can maybe have like the DLIs, if there's any left, um, dig into that, while. you know, like and maybe get something out from a awareness perspective. I, I, th I think it's in our best interest to educate our community, particularly as like, you're, you're speaking as a parent, that's a great tip. And um, I think we can, we can try to figure out how to put something out as a result of some of the, the shifts and the lack of um, our ability to fully staff some of these positions. That's something that with a fully staffed DLI department we could, we could turn around quickly. But I think we share an interest in wanting parents to partner with us on preserving the amount of time we have. So I think it only behooves us to, to get something out around how to create. Um, my student can communicate with five people, me, this person, grandma, grandpa, neighbor, and sibling, and that's their core group, uh, that, and then beyond that, they can't um, access a phone from this time to this time to, to text beyond their immediate family. That can be done through Apple. Every parent can do that. That's not a paid uh, feature, um, but I think we can we can um, try to figure out how to make get that out. I think that's part of a great uh, parent ed type piece that we can put out to try to help us all. Um, we're going to do this together. I think the last comment I would just make is you may notice a theme around trying to preserve the instructional moments, um, whether it's a cell phone, an earbud, or a hood, or whatever it is. It's about 
uh, a commitment, not only at Franklin Public Schools, but you are seeing it in the news from many other districts around how do we, how do we try to limit the amount of distraction and take the, um, not the, the, the need or the want to try to engage with a phone when it's very easily accessible or an earbuds in my ear. And it's an effort to try to help us so that we can uh, make sure that students are getting the most out of the time that they spend with us during those, those key moments of instructional time. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Al. Um, I I love the cell phone policy. Thank you for implementing that. I know it, it was uh, something I was really pushing to bring back. Um, more so that the the teachers don't have to police it. Like I just want to like lighten the load a little bit. Um, like to your point, like before, like people kids the policy was to have them off, but then the teachers like, are you recording under your desk? And it's like they're having to like get distracted. So that's awesome. Um, I noticed when I was reading the policy, like it, it says, like you know, Franklin Public Schools isn't responsible for like damaged cell phones or whatnot. Like if something crazy happened and it, I don't know, the shoe holder thing fell off or whatever. So if people have like you know, really really expensive cell phones, just don't even bring them because um, if you're not willing to like part with it. So is this something that the teachers um, uh, feel? Like they're all doing it's not it's not something they think is optional like I'm gonna be the nice teacher like I just want to yeah we talked today about the importance of consistency and how that is actually just going to help them run their classrooms better and, and I think we're in a position where everybody is on board okay and, and part of the planning of this policy which was the work of our full admin team this summer was very deliberate and also providing like the tiered uh, interventions and responses to the infractions so that they have consistent language and um, consistent actions and responses to kids when they're not complying, um, which I think will be helpful. Sure, sure. And I know you know you were an assistant for a bit, and now you're a principal. And Mike, you're an assistant, and I hear great feedback about the work that the assistants do to kind of help manage the school um, and and behaviors and things. So, um, anything we can do, um, keep us posted. I don't want to put you on the spot, but as far as just kind of managing these behaviors and making it easy, so if a teacher, you know, gets disrespected in the hallway, and the high school's big, there's thousands of kids there, you don't know everyone's name. I hear stories sometimes where it's like, you know, this this kid mouths off and says something completely insane to a teacher, and the teacher wants to figure out who it is, but it's like, do I go to my class now, or do I go try to figure out who this kid is, or do I stay after school, and do I look at the tapes, and then I become like, you know, um, like a, a, a prosecutor, detective. Um, so anything we could do to help you if we need to go back to old fashioned citations or something to just make it like quick, easy response. Um, just keep that in mind. Um, and then um, I, like, I like the, if you refuse to be searched, that's an admission of guilt. Um, I, think, I think that you know, it's like sometimes when we're saying these things out loud, it's like, oh, we're so harsh, we're like this institution. But I think that the kids who are sort of riddled with anxiety and like, you know, they, they, they want this. It's like, um, I, I was talking to a teacher, I was like, whatever happened to the bus monitors, you know? Um, and it's like, I remember like, we liked the bus <laughs> monitors. They were protecting us from, you know, little Johnny like putting boogers on us and things. Like those were the guys we liked. So, um, so I, I, like, I like these rules that help you out. Um, the the middle school um, awesome. Let's just keep it that way because they don't know any better. Like the Val Devel no cell. Good job. Um, you'll have your hands full next year. So um, I, I liked what you said about like having the tiered sort of um, late policy because um, it does give you the ability to recognize when something's going on at home and, and then you can get involved. So. It's, it's just awesome that that's, I know that's the lens that all of you guys work under, but it's, it's just nice to know that our kids are in your hands. Um, and, uh, oh, the forgotten items thing. I remember firsthand, like walking in and, and Beth uh, Simon, who used to be the admin at Horseman, was like, we're getting three items every 10 minutes. And it's like, there was a, a sheet outside, like an experiment one day, did your, child contact you or did you contact your child do they know that you're bringing this in and, and like I remember my because you get you start to get information from the kids 
And my daughter one day was like, some kid, some girl was screaming about using the phone because her mother didn't give her the big enough bag of Cheetos and things. So it's, it's, I know it's frivolous. I know these admins can't get any work done because we're just showing up saving the day, my helicopter parent generation. So, um, so when they drop the item off in the foyer and there's no need to enter the school, is that like the little area prior to the second door? Correct. Okay. Hopefully that'll help a bit. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I know Lucas mentioned earlier that we don't have a driver shortage on the buses. Let's keep it that way. Um, you know, some of these kids, the bus drivers get like shell shocked with these kids on the bus. So thanks. Hopefully we have a great start to the new year. So um, I guess I don't have any questions, but great job. I'm with you. I've got your back. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so to our members online, KP, do you have any questions? Um, thank you, Kim. It's a great uh, work of the policies. And I just have one question on the elementary school attendance. Like it says 10% uh, of our time and absence is excused, vacation enrollment, and days are more. Was it the same thing for the 23-24 or is this new one introduced in 24-25? I think we were in a pattern of um, looking at attendance in January, um, and we were we would monitor for students, and I think that at some point um, the absentees were a little bit more excessive by the time we hit January in some instances. So we felt by being more proactive in communicating with families, um, it would be a good way to reach out and connect, and, and how can we support your family um, if there is something? Just kind of opening up a conversation earlier rather than later around attendance um, and how we can um, support um, in a more timely way. Okay, thank you, that's all I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, it's a great team effort, thank you. Thank you, KP, and uh, Chair Callahan. Thank you all uh, very much for that. Um, just a comment with, uh, in terms of the cell phone policy at the high school, really just wanna um, commend you guys uh, for the work and really just for the sensible uh, policy and practice uh, that kind of we're seeing here. Um, yeah, I've read stories over the years uh, where school districts have tried to implement this and either they've gone for some kind of complex like locker systems that uh, frankly we just we can't afford. Um, and it seems it's like over the years a lot of the school districts also can continue to afford um, or other ones where uh, the, the phones are with uh, the kiddos and just as, as a parent uh, into the kind of school culture that is something that kind of just does terrify me. And so uh, just the idea that this is something that isn't going to be a financial hit, uh, it's something that's easily, you know, kind of just done year over year over year, but at the same time keeps the phones just in the, the, the physical classroom uh, with the kiddos, even though they don't have access to it, is um, so just as a parent kind of gives me peace of mind. So great work on this. I'm sure there was a lot of back and forth and different iterations that kind of came about, but I really love how this is um, going to be implemented. And uh, you know, I hope nothing but the, the best of success, and I hope that it's, um, uh, you, know, you really do kind of see that uh, big academic increase and the, the decrease in the distractions like that we're shooting for. But kudos, great job. Thank you very much. The uh, thank you all for just I mean, all the work you've been doing on the handbooks, but also just all the preparation you've been doing um, for this year. So just you know, I want to thank you all for that. And then a couple questions of mine as well um, regarding to the so the high school cell phone policy. So from from what I understand, you know, you know, at the start of each class period, it'll be the expectation that the students you know bring the cell phone to their particular uh, particular slot. That there's not going to be like a search. Um, from the from the teachers at all, just be they'll be asked, and students will be expected to put it up there. Um, so, what what in what in terms of the um, intervention or, or disciplinary measures exist if if a student's caught lying? Like not not that someone like like is honest, mistaken, forgets, but like actually is you know asked to put their cell phone, says they don't have it, and then is later caught texting or watching a video or something. What are um, what what's involved at that point? That's a great question. So we, we're going to have a tiered response as well, mm -hmm. you know. So if we like, if we saw that student in the hallway and they actually had a phone, um, and they're in the hallway during instructional time, um, you know, they, we would have them. We would encourage whoever saw that to 
um, send them to the house office, speak to an assistant principal, um, and you know, we'd start with a, a warning and to, to take the phone for the rest of the day, and then we'd it would it would be a tiered response that would get you know uh, increasingly more serious. But really, our goal is just to not have the phone. Mm -hmm. So we're not really interested in uh, in consequences that aren't logical like that. Yeah. What, what we're really looking for is, is just to uh, have the student get um, <coughs> accept the idea that they can't have their phone during instructional time. Yeah, and I think that's very reasonable. It makes it makes the most sense. And I. I guess I'd more just ask, just so we're not like creating a, an unintentional loophole that you know, if the students think like, oh, well, they're not going to actually check, so I don't want to. But uh, that's I just won't won't tell them about it. But uh, it's encouraging that there there'll still be the, the um, disciplinary mechanism in place. That'll be an effective policy that way. And then um, another question is to follow up. So you mentioned like the different intervention tiers. So will those kind of like carry over from day to day, or like is it just like a new day, like a like if you start back at tier one, and like how does like how, how does that work if you notice that there's a particular student who you keep having issues with? Right, this is also a great question. Um, so I'd say it depends a little bit. Um, we're really encouraging the relationships between teachers and students, right? So if this infractions happens in a classroom, uh, and we really you know, also want teachers to own their classroom space, right, mm -hmm. and, be, and command their own space. So that first sort of tier and those initial things would happen and the intervention would take place between the teacher and the student and whatever consequence. And we gave you know, suggestions, a, a conversation, a call home. Once the student gets to the point where it's repeated and the teacher decides to write a conduct referral on Aspen, then it becomes recorded. <coughs> and so that would then build up. So <coughs> they might have, um, you know, the assistant principal would read the infraction and they might see that one student's name, it's repeated, and now they have you know one in one class, but they're up to three or four infractions over a course of a number of days. So the consequences um, would be pro progressive as it builds up. Um, so it doesn't necessarily reset every day, because if, you know, if that's mm -hmm. the case, they might have a consequence one day and then have to start over, and that um, there goes our tiered system, yeah. if that makes sense. No, it does, thank you. And, uh, and Thank you for making this just a well-thought-out policy um, that's enforceable, because I, I think I'm, I'm very supportive of this. You know, not only are we trying to instill in our students you know, academic learning, but also we're teaching them life skills, and being able to concentrate and focus on an assignment is something that you need to do in life, and I think that's um, important that we're also reinforcing that here um, in Franklin Public Schools. So um, thank you, and I really hope that you find success in this and that it creates um, a better culture for students and teachers um, through this. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and then uh, one last question, maybe Lucas, this is more um, directed your way for the admin team. Um, so the, the new policy the for the district policy regarding the collection of outstanding school meal account balances, I know mm -hmm. this is a new thing and we had some questions about this in the past. Can you maybe just reiterate this? Um, sure, Dr. Maybe? Rogers actually is uh, prepared to speak to that. She can. <laughs> the, the school meal yes. policy? She oversees policy, that's why. <laughs> so just a few updates as to the uh, modifications that were made last school year um, as it relates to the credit balances, is that? Ex yeah, exactly, just because we've had people, had a number of inquiries about this in the past, and I just thought it would be a good sure. reminder so, before the school uh, Sure, year. absolutely, so these are the few updates. So um, if you have prepaid funds on your account through Unipay, um, there is a process which, well, every school year those funds will carry over to the next school year. Should you want to transfer any balances to a sibling, that can be done through Unipay. You can, of course, reach out to Food Services and they'll assist in that process. You could also, at the end of the year, if you are transferring out of public um, Franklin Public Schools or if your student graduated, you can request to transfer those funds to another student that's still enrolled. And we, again, can help you with that process and you can call the Food Service Department for um, support with that. Additionally, um, if, um, again, you graduate or you move out of the Franklin Public Schools, um, you need to request a refund for any balance over $25. So those funds will remain in your child's account for one calendar year. And once those requests are made, that refund will be made to the families. 
should the request extend beyond one school year, then those funds will become part of um, Franklin Public Schools and we'll use those monies to offset um, uncollected fees and things of that nature. Thank you very much for that sure. recap. Appreciate that. All right. And any, any other questions that come to mind? Yes, I do. Sorry. All right. Al? <laughs> I should write, write the other ones down. Um, can we just expand on how families are getting the yearbooks, just so folks, if they're not aware? I know we'll, we'll do our approval process, but what happens next, and how do people get the yearbooks? Oh, not sorry. Handbook, sorry. Handbook, I'm sorry. Handbook, okay. handbook sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get back to you on that one. Um, <laughs> so uh, after the handbooks are approved, we will post them online. Um, they'll be available. Uh, parents can access them. Any parent who requests, who would wish to have a printed copy, we will provide a printed copy of the specific school handbook. They just need to email the school secretary directly and say, I'd like a printed copy. Great, great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, and parents do have to sign off that they read the handbook, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of parents are going to read the 156-page handbooks. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, well. Your books are the spring. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm already at the end of the school year. Sorry. <laughs> Get ahead of ourselves. Huh? All right. Well, uh, thank you all. Um, okay. So we'll um, we'll do these these three votes for the handbooks, and we'll move on. All right. So I will entertain a motion to approve the elementary student handbooks as detailed. So moved. Second. All right. Um, because we have members online, we need to do a roll call vote. So uh, Gallagher? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Charles? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Sampali? Yes. And Callahan? Yes. And McNeil? Yes. Motion passes. Um, next, I will entertain a motion to approve the middle school student handbooks as detailed. So moved. Second. All right. Gallagher? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Charles? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Sampali? Yes. Callahan? Yes. And McNeil? Yes. Motion passes. And I will entertain a motion to approve the FHS student handbook as detailed. So moved. I'll second. Okay. There we go. Uh, Gallagher? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Charles? Yes. O'Sullivan? Yes. Sampali? Yes. And Callahan? Yeah. And McNeil? Yes. All right. Motion passes. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good year. Ch Chairman McNeil, or Vice Chair McNeil, and the Callahan. Chair Callahan. Um, I'm noticing in the agenda uh, the ECDC handbook had no substantive changes, but it was included in, the, um, in your packet for approval. Um, our principal for the ECDC is here, uh, Ms. Kim Taylor. And uh, that was supposed to be listed with elementary and then um, the early childhood um, handbook, which you have access to for review. Um, I'm, rec I'm wondering if you would be willing to uh, include that as part of a vote. So it may require you to amend the agenda to include an additional action item, but you'd need the committee to vote to approve that as part of the agenda. Okay. Um, yeah, so we could. Just, um, I apologize for the complication here. It's no problem. Yeah, we could um, just do a. Do a separate vote for that, right? You would. So you just, I think it's not on the agenda, so you need two votes. One to um, approve the the addition of the approval. approval of the ECDC student handbook for vote uh, to be put on the agenda. And then, uh, then we'll pick up with the next part. Okay. I'll make a motion to add the ECDC handbook to our agenda tonight. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. Gallagher. Yes. Griffith. Yes. Charles. Yes. O'Sullivan. Yes. Sampali. Yes. Callahan. Yeah. And McNeil. Yes. Motion passes. Excellent. Right. Let's obtain a motion to approve the CDC handbook. So moved. Second. Gallagher. Yes. Griffith. Yes. Charles. Yes. O'Sullivan. Yes. Sampali. Yes. Callahan. Yes. And McNeil. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And thank you, Ms. Taylor, yes, for, thank you, Ms. Taylor, for <laughs> being here. There was no major changes other than adding her name to the handbook. <laughs> Great. Good change. Any questions. All right. Um, all right. I see next up on discussion action items. We have uh, 
FY twenty five revised final budget vote. Um, do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Um, could we get some details on this, please? Yep. So uh, basically, what's before you is we finalized the budget season, but uh, you had taken votes to approve the final budget and then the additional funding that we had received subsequent to when you approved. So for auditing purposes, the bottom line, so it's, it's basically totaling um, in the same packet you had last meeting, but for compliance purposes, uh, we need to approve the full amount allocated for the school year. So it's combining all the previous approvals that you've given into one number for, uh, for compliance purposes. So I would recommend approval of the FY25 school budget in the amount of $77,470,190 as discussed. All right, having a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion or questions? So I guess my question, not necessarily specific about the budget now, I'm more just thinking next year, right? So when we do the budget, um, whatever we are looking to grow by would be, this would be the base that we would look at and it would be increased by whatever were allocated from the town, is that correct? This includes the one million for the fiscal year of one-time funding. Okay. So I would say that we wouldn't want to base the perpetual funding based off this number, but this is a number for us to operate within this school year, including all monies coming to the school in one number. Yeah, the, right. base, the base would be less than one million. Okay, okay. thank you. Thanks, good clarifying question. Um, yeah, that was my question too. So, John, you're just, you, you've got this. Um, you know that we're already starting a million in the hole if we're at level. <laughs> oh, well, we won't be, but that's, yeah. So, no, no matters. Uh, for our members online, any uh, comments or questions on this? I'm good, thank you. Oh, thanks, Mike. All right, so, uh, vote will come on the motion. Gallagher? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Charles? Yes. O'Sullivan? Yes. Sampali? Yes. Callahan? Yes. And McNeil? Yes. The motion passes. And last but certainly not least, <laughs> policy, second reading, um, entertain a motion to adopt policy BBEBD. Uh, so moved. Second. All right. Um, anything on this one? It's the second read. Uh, we presented the policy last meeting. This is um, as per the process to allow us to um, expand our fundraising opportunities. Um, and we went through in detail some of the questions from last meeting. And Dr. Rogers, I don't know if there's anything to add, um, but we're looking for approval so we can implement this uh, as we kick the school year off. All right. Any comments or questions on this? No. Nope. Anything from our members online? Well All right. Vote will come on the motion. Gallagher? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Charles? Yes. O'Sullivan? Yes. Sampali? Yes. Callahan? Yes. And McNeil? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. All right. Next on discussion only items. See, so we have a new hire update. The new hire update I provided during my superintendent report. Uh, I see it listed here on the agenda, but I did provide the data that I had available for this update. And the, the, the document I shared uh, with you earlier was the, was the latest information we have. All right, excellent. Uh, any discussion on this? Any comments or questions from members online? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, information matters, moving right along, so. Um, Superintendent evaluation, no updates at this time. For budget, um, no updates at this time. However, for the joint budget subcommittee, we have a meeting on September 11th. I believe that is a Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, at 7 p.m. in the council chambers. And uh, policy, Ms. Sullivan? Uh, nothing at this time. Community relations, Charles? Um, yep, so. Uh, as of right now, nothing's on the books. Uh, however, given that it's the start of school year, we're going to let things kind of settle first. Um, I will be reaching out to the superintendent and also the committee members just to find availability, and then we'll get into our cadence. Um, there'll probably be 
um, setting goals for this year, um, talking about the new website, and actually, nice plug, um, the new website is up. Um, I like it. I think it's, it's better than the old one. Uh, is it perfect? No, but we can we can work towards it. I think it's a, it's a great starting point. Um, but we'll talk about that. How do we improve it, and how do we leverage all of the communication capabilities that come from it? Um, and then also, uh, if you all don't have the app, get the app on your phone. It just makes it so easy to be able to kind of keep up to date what's happening. Um, um, move uh, school committee meetings onto your calendar, onto your phone, which is so you don't miss out on, on when these events are happening. And I know there's probably going to be a dozen different ways that the schools are using it just to keep people aware of what's happening because there's a lot of stuff happening this year with redistricting. Um, going to go live next year, you know, potential override stuff, all the, all the things that you want to be aware of, um, the app will, should help keep you looped in. So. Thank you. Um, see a uh, comprehensive facilities, Chair Callahan. Thank you very much. So um, I think we could, uh, I know one of the biggest concerns we kind of had was Maybe not too far ahead of it, especially on the boundary lines and kiddos going to the wrong schools tomorrow. Um, now that school will be in session, everybody knows you know what school they'll be going to and that the changes that we've already voted on and we'll be working towards uh, aren't coming to effect until next fall. Um, I think uh, Superintendent Jagir, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, probably at the next uh, meeting on September 10th, we'll start to be able to hear more information about um, kind of the work that's already been done, where we stand, and some of the next uh, steps forward. Correct. We will be providing more information once we kick the year off, and uh, you can expect to hear about that uh, in our future school committee meetings. The other uh, comment you made, I'm recalling, you said, oh, it was the Comprehensive Facilities Subcommittee you mentioned, um, Vice Chair Callahan, uh, McNeil, is not a committee anymore it was voted as not a committee so I just would point out that we have to give we have to provide updates on the master planning um, but that particular committee was voted um, to be disbanded after that study was done we need to That's now right, yeah. incorporate new methods in which we're working together um, to provide information to the community and seek input but I wanted to just put that out there as we as we continue to move this forward thank you thank you for uh, that clarification yep um, join PCC Charles. Yep. Uh, so far, we have reached out to the uh, PCC leadership team uh, to get their availability, um, trying to figure out what works best um, for our meetings, because there's going to be a lot of discussion on how do we transition from the existing PCC structure onto the new PCC structure. Um, so they'll be ongoing throughout the year um, in parallel with the redistricting talks as well. Um, so. We don't have a date yet, but it's probably going to be late September, early October-ish. So hopefully next week I'll have a final, uh, next meeting I'll have a final date. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, School Wellness Advisory Council, uh, Sampali. We haven't met yet this month, but we are anticipating the next month. All right. Thank you. Mental Health and Wellbeing Task Force, so all of them. Um, same. We haven't met yet. But I do have some things to advertise yes. if I could. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. We will be having we will be joining the rec department and be at the movie night on September sixth on the town common. They will be playing inside out. Members of the mental health and well being task force will be, be there playing games, making popcorn and doing other fun things and handing out resources. Also, uh, we will also have a table at the Harvest Fest on September twenty seventh. Our first meeting is anticipated to be in October. So I'll be sending out emails soon. Excellent, thank you. Excellent movie choice as well. Yes. And then the uh, last DEI committee, Paula. Um, we have not met. All right. There we go. So then we have the consent agenda. I recommend approval of the minutes from your August 13th, 2024 meeting as detailed. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as detailed? So moved. Is there a second? No second. All right. Do a roll call vote. Gallagher? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Charles? question. Oh, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, I wasn't here that meeting, so do I vote or do not? I don't vote. You can still okay. vote to approve okay. that. So. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sullivan? Yes. Callahan? Yes. 
McNeil, yes. Motion carries. And citizens' comments. Are there any citizens in the audience, in person, online, who would like to make comments on an item not on tonight's agenda? That and falls within the committee's purview. Do we have anyone online? Or with Steve? I'm just anyone? checking right now. All right. Not seeing anyone, so then we'll move on to new business. So new business, it is the season where we start to begin to uh, share our district improvement plans and then our level-based school improvement plans with the school committee for approval. So the approval process just starts throughout the fall. Um, handbooks is the start. Um, I would put out, we have been reflecting on handbook and the policy approval window, and we are considering moving that up uh, somewhat as opposed to doing it in late August, maybe trying to move that up to a meeting, uh, an earlier meeting if possible, which would require us to have that information available in time enough for, for you to read it and have it. But I just wanted to put that out there to you all as we continue to plan and look at the time frame. So um, that's one thing I would say on the handbooks. For next meeting, we're looking at the district improvement plan, which will trigger the school improvement plans. We have a Franklin TV appointment every three years. You have to appoint a uh, liaison. I will have more information. Um, I'm making sure the I want to make sure I have the criteria correct from Franklin TV, and then we will also have an update on our uh, beginning weeks of school and and let you know how how that's progressing um, throughout the time, along with other updates that you would expect to see around um, the reorganization, the staffing, and uh, if we have any other transportation information that's appropriate for at that time, we'll share that as well. Thank you very much. All right, and. Last, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? second? All right. Gallagher. Yes. Griffith. Yes. Charles. Yes. Sullivan. Yes. Sampali. Yes. Callahan. Yes. McNeil. Yes. Good night, everyone. We are now producing this in collaboration with Franklin TV and Franklin Public Radio. This podcast is my public service effort for Franklin, but we can't do it alone. We can always use your help. How can you help? If you can use the information that you find here, please tell your friends and neighbors. If you don't like something here, please let me know. Through this feedback loop, we can continue to make improvements. And I thank you for listening. For additional information, please visit franklinmatters.org. If you have questions or comments, you can reach me directly at sure Steve at gmail.com. The music for the intro and exit was provided by Michael Clark and the group East of Shirley. The piece is titled Ernesto Manana, copyright Michael Clark and Tin Type Tunes in 2008 and used with their permission. I hope you enjoy. By the way, you can also subscribe and listen to Franklin Matters Radio on your favorite podcast app. Search in podcasts for Franklin Matters.